Hello, hello. Ron Callis here with another episode of Automation Unplugged. Today is Wednesday, March 24th, a little bit after 1230. And uh, I hope you all are, are doing well. Uh, what I'm going to do, as I always do, I'm going to jump over to Facebook and make sure that we are actually streaming. So bear with me here as I make sure that technology is behaving. All right, there we are. This does look like we are streaming. If you are out there listening or watching, don't forget to drop into the comments, give us a like or a share, uh, and or let us know where you're coming to us from. That's always appreciated and well received. And yeah, looks like everything is working out so far. All right, cool. Uh, let's go ahead. Who, are, who do we have on the show today? Uh, this is show 162, and uh, we have uh, a friend of One Firefly, a longtime client, and uh, this person actually has uh, a lot of fun stuff outside of the world of AV to share in that uh, uh, Ryan Davis, uh, the president at Ratio AV, uh, is actually a race car driver, or he's, he, I guess he would call it a race truck driver. And uh, he has a, a lot of wins and success under his belt, actually, uh, with Baja 1000 races. And uh, I know I'm excited to learn all about that and, uh, and share that with all of you. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring in Ryan and let's, uh, let's get the show started. Ryan, how are you, sir? Awesome. How are you, Ron? I am good. We we made it happen. I know we've talked for a while about getting you on the show and our, our schedules aligned and we made it happen. You guys would not believe what it costs to get Ron to get you on his show. Oh, it, it there's tens of thousands of dollars and, and yeah, right. Exactly. No, just kidding. Um, Ryan, where are you at? Where are you coming to us from? Um, let's let the audience know kind of your situation. Where are you? Uh, I'm in Farmington, Utah, which is about 15 miles north of Salt Lake City, so right close to Salt Lake City. Okay, and Ratio AV. Give us a quick summary of Ratio AV. What type of firm are you? Maybe size, types of projects? Yeah, I would say we're probably on the small to medium size as far as integration companies go. We've got uh, seven people on staff, and five of those are installers, so, and then uh, two, two here in the office plus me. I don't really count myself, but maybe I could. So, um, so we started off. I guess I started off in two thousand two. Uh, I was attending the University of Utah studying mechanical engineering, and um, I just a fellow ME. I, I did. And so I got lots of questions around that, but I'll let you get through the whole storyline here of your background before we we go there. But yeah, I, I, I love talking about mechanical engineering. It's great. Yes. Um, so I, uh, I started in 2002 and I just needed something kind of flexible while I was finishing school. So I, I was kind of a part timer for the first uh, two or three years. And then uh, when I graduated in 2005, that's when I kind of put the pedal down and started doing doing more, but uh, just pretty organic growth, pretty slow growth, but uh, all word of mouth and, and happy with where we're at. I mean, up, up into a certain point, we've We've obviously used you for our uh, for our marketing in the last several years, but um, but the the beginning growing was slow. So, Emmy, why did you choose to study Emmy? What were your ambitions? Well, um, I chose to to study Emmy because uh, I was I did start off in electrical engineering, and um, I'm going to say that I got bored of electrical engineering, but I'm not going to say it like I was too smart for electrical engineering. Uh, I know that I was definitely not too smart for electrical engineering. That shit's hard. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't too smart for civil engineering, and we always pick on the civil engineers anyway. I'm, exactly. It, that's, it's, that's true. It's, it's a fun pecking order in engineering school. The EEs pick on the MEs, and the MEs pick on the on the civil engineers. And the civil engineers pick on the industrial engineers. And, and, and it goes so on and so forth. But, uh, yeah. but no, so I was in electrical engineering, and I was actually uh, – a buddy of mine had developed a crossover technology for speakers and 
I don't know, audio has just sort of been like my life since I was like 13 or 14 years old. I, uh, I had a neighbor that had the most insane sound system. I mean, this was in the eighties and he had earthquake horns out of the Grumman Chinese theater in his basement. And so, I mean, talking about stuff that nobody had in their basement and people still don't have in their basements. And I just could not get enough of that. And, um, audio just sort of bit me hard, but anyway, uh, a, a buddy of mine had developed this crossover technology for uh, for for speakers, and I went to work helping him develop that. And uh, I was we were actually working for Ray Kimber uh, at Kimber Cable. A lot of the high end guys will know that that brand. Uh, they're here in Ogden, about twenty five minutes away from where I am. But um, I I was helping them with that, and we were making some really great sounding loudspeakers. And my whole point of being an electrical engineer was that I wanted to make the world's greatest speaker. And I don't know that I ever made the world's greatest speaker. There's a lot of really great speakers out there, but we made some really great speakers uh, to the point where I was sort of satisfied and sort of bored of that pursuit. I don't know. I mean, I hate to say bored of that pursuit. But did you like? How, where did the the speaker? I mean, you were a college student. Where did the the desire, even the know-how, or the desire to to want to build the world's greatest speaker or a crossover network? Like, did your were your parents? Did you have friends that were into music or speakers? Do you know where that came from? Well, so again, it all started with my neighbor Carl Lechenberg, and uh, from then it moved forward. You know, when I was like. I probably 15, I got a job, my, my first full-time job installing car stereos um, at a local car stereo shop. And, okay. um, and so like my parents had dropped me off, my parents had picked me up and it was just like, I mean, I just loved this, anything to do with audio, but the guy that ran the shop, um, you know, he became a, a good friend of mine, Eric Alexander, and he's still very active in the speaker design community. And he even builds and sells speakers that are kind of catered toward the high end market. But um, I don't know. He had, he he was very knowledgeable, and we would just we would just discuss things nonstop about what could make a speaker better and what could you know how could we build a better speaker. And it was just sort of an endless pursuit of both of us. But he was definitely the brains behind that. The you know most of what we did, and I would never take that away. But also, he kind of lacked in computers and measurement techniques and that kind of thing. So I brought a lot of that stuff to the table. And we, we were just a, a, a good complimentary team to each other. But um, I don't know, I guess I, I always equate it to, and this is probably a direct tie to what we do day to day is that um, people's love for sound can really only be as great as their love for music and what they want to listen mm. to, I think. And so um, I love music and I want to hear it the best way that I can, you know, so I've got a lot of different sound systems. I've got big PA systems. I've got like high end two channel stuff. And I just, I just always want to hear it the best I can hear it. So, um, so that's probably what motivated my drive to. Did, did that passion for music, is that what led you to start ratio or start, you know, an AV or integration business? You said in 2002, is that how that happened? Or was there another path that led to that business getting formed? Yeah, so this is what I'd realized in when I was doing the speaker design is that I didn't I didn't have a lot of communication with the outside. I mean, um, the people that we would work with were manufacturers mostly because um, this was a technology that was trying to be sold to manufacturers, like licensed to them. Um, but um, I don't need to get too deep into that. But the people that I would talk to on a day to day basis would be like engineers from other companies or uh, you know people who owned other companies and there wasn't a lot of satisfaction there for me. I like being around people. I like working with people and I like to see the end result. I like to see how people receive the end result. So for me, I really wanted to get into something where I could see the end result, which was kind of on the front lines here, which is, you know, putting things in and making things sound good. And um, I also just love solving problems too. I love the custom side of, of the industry and making things do stuff that other people's things don't do or aren't, necessarily made to do you know so uh ted here posted a question yeah he said i'm sure many out there listening are wondering he said ryan what's on your spotify playlist 
uh, just in in general, or like what's some stuff that I've been listening? Yeah, to? Yeah, maybe you you know what are, what is what is some music that you might recommend? Uh, you know, is there like I I'm not good at that, and I I've built quite some title playlists uh, based on recommendations from you know my friends and and folks out in the industry. Anything that's top of mind for you? Well. This is like a very a very deep discussion here that we're that we're sneaking. Uh, are are we are we are we slipping down the rabbit hole here no, of music? No, <laughs> but I mean I, I, I don't want to get too far off into the weeds as far as the music goes. But um, I've been listening to a lot of Jason Isbell lately. Uh, Jason Isbell in the four hundred unit, and okay. uh, for me, it's been kind of hard for me to get into newer music because. I just feel like, uh, you know, when you're younger and more impressionable, the music means more to you. So there's a reason why a lot of us old guys, as they would say, um, and I'm, I'm learning to call myself an old guy. I'm just accepting this. So you're um, old. I'm not, we might be the same <laughs> age, but you're, you're the old guy. I think, uh, there's a reason why it's hard for us to, uh, you know, why we always turn back to the stuff that we've listened to since we were in high school or whatever, because those were the ages where we were most impressionable and the, the, the music leaves an imprint on us, you know? So I would say the newer music doesn't, doesn't leave as much of an imprint on me, but as far as newer things go, I like Jason Isbell a lot. Um, one, one of my favorite bands of all time is my morning jacket. Um, so they started off in kind of the early two thousands and I've kind of fought. In fact, there's a, there's a poster right above my, ear Oh yeah. Right my morning jacket. I see it jacket right there. I've got concert posters all over in the office here, but, um, and I, of course, I just like can't get enough of the greats like Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and that kind of stuff. And I mean, I, I actually get together. There's there's three high school buddies of mine that I get together with once a month and we do like a book club for just music. So we come up with these lists like top top seven drum tracks, top seven sophomore albums. That's brilliant. Uh, Is it might alcohol might be involved? <laughs> Alcohol is not involved. No, wow, <laughs> that's amazing. That sounds like it might even be better with a few extra chemicals. That, it, that... Probably, it probably would be. Yep, yep, it probably would be. But um, no, we and so so I would say it's a, it's a there's probably not that many people who are having music club with their buddies once a month. So I guess I'm, I'm relatively into music. So no, that that is Im impressive. By the way, we have quite a uh, uh, an active chat going here. So Brandy. Just mentioned, she says, a book club for music. I love it. Thank you, Brandy. And I want to go back up here. Uh, uh, Matt, maybe this is a, so obviously someone you know. He says, I walked with Ryan at the U of U and saw it firsthand. They heckled the civil engineers to tears. Uh, that's, that, is, that is pretty funny. And uh, Melissa Nakaya says that you make the world's greatest ramen. Is that I, By the way, I'm a huge ramen fan. So is she full? Is she telling the truth? Well, I don't, I mean, it might've been the best ramen she's ever had, but I mean, we've been, to, we've been to Japan together. So, um, but I don't know. I make a pretty mean bowl of ramen. Like, I, but I, I like, like is, does not ramen to make this broth? Doesn't that take a long time? I mean, it, I, it takes a long time. Like it takes, I mean, like I make the noodles and everything. So like, like I'll, I'll make the noodles. It'll take a few hours one night just to make the noodles. And then you set those aside and then, then the broth and everything takes, yeah, like a day, day and a half. So, um, wow. yeah, no, I've, I've, I've made some mean bowls of ramen before. That's for sure. And I don't know, Melissa wouldn't be SS. Her last name is Nakaya. I mean, she's, she's practically half Japanese, you know? I, I agree. I think she would know. I, that's, that's pretty cool. And then Drew Nakaya, uh, he's saying the dead. I'm oh, guess yeah. the, the grateful dead. It, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a religious dead follower. Um, I guess you could say on the bus, but never saw one live show because I was just kind of out of that age bracket. So. Yeah. And your comment about listening to music from your youth. I mean, that resonates with me. I, I went to school. I'm the same. I'm the same age as you. So I, I, except I went, older. except you're older and I'm younger, but we're the same age. And uh, I, you know, the music from the '90s, for me, like when I think of all that music that just makes me feel at home and just you know reminisce about, yeah. I guess, my youth or maybe most comfortable. I realize most of those bands are from the '90s. It's the imprint. You know, that's when I was in high school and, and college and, and young and impressionable. And that's and I agree. I 
I couldn't name a band for the last 15 years. I mean, I guess I could name it, but I don't listen to any of it regularly. Yeah, I'm with um, you. And when I was in high school 15 years ago, it seemed like it was like an eternity ago. And now it just seems like oh, it was just like 15 years ago. So uh, Mackenzie, act, she's actually on Team One Firefly, and she's saying best ramen place in Salt Lake City. What do you got? Um, my house. Oh, I, I think that's an invite, Mackenzie. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I'm reading that. That's that not like an invitation. Uh, yeah, Pearl Jam. That's funny. Pearl Jam was rolling around in my head, Melissa, when we were talking about you know bands from the '90s. You put on some Pearl Jam or Nirvana or something like that, and I'm like, man, I, I or Dave Matthews or you know, I'm I'm jamming with all that. And we have uh, Carlos. Welcome to the show. Music and noodles. What else you need? I agree. That's life. All right. So talk to me about racing. You are, I'm putting, I'm going to put it on the screen here. I've got, for those that are listening only, I've got a picture of a badass Toyota race truck with just a huge rooster tail of dirt and sand flying behind it. Um, what is this racing thing that you do that you're into? Uh, so this is off-road desert racing, and there aren't a lot of places in the country that you can do this just because of uh, public lands and whatnot. But this is a totally on the up and up. It's all you know regulated by the BLM and all that. But this, these are sponsored or uh, sanctioned races. Um, this picture that he's showing now was from last November. That was down in Ensenada, Mexico at the Baja 1000. We took first place in our class in, in that race. Um, we race in the stock full-size class, which means that basically that vehicle is more or less stock. I mean, the only thing that we have is, you know, $20,000 worth of shocks and, uh, and some big tires and a lot of safety equipment. So like the roll cage and the lights and all that kind of stuff. But otherwise that, that Toyota, that's, what is that? A Land Cruiser? Yep, that's a Land Cruiser, 2008 Land Cruiser. And it's, it's basically bone stock other than that. Like all of the suspension parts that we buy to replace that we buy them from Toyota. So is that a characteristic of the Baja? I'm, I'm a Baja 1000 newbie. So maybe just educate us. What is the Baja 1000? What is the, the requirements of the race? Okay. So the Baja 1000 started in, in 1967. And, uh, and the way that the race kind of traditionally sits is that it goes from Ensenada down to La Paz, which is at the very tip of the Baja Peninsula. And uh, the way that the race is formatted these days is that the race starts and you get X amount of time to finish the race. So, uh, so uh, in a, on the longer races, you get a longer finishing time, but let's say uh, on a longer race down the peninsula that you've got 40 or 42 hours to finish the race. You don't, you, you don't get like to bivouac up. You don't get to like stop and stay in a hotel or anything like that. Like the car is going the entire time. So your crew is running for 48 hours straight. Yep. Our very first, our very first Baja finish was 42 hours. We had a 45 hour finishing window and we were, we were going for 42 hours my first stint in the car in Baja was, I think, either 12 or 14 hours straight. And uh, like Parnelli Jones, who's a famous driver, said, uh, he said, Baja, <laughs> driving in the Baja 1000 is like being uh, in a 24-hour plane wreck, is what he said. And <laughs> now, uh, it's, it's just rough. I mean, the course is beat up, and you're kind of getting jostled around a lot. A lot. When I got in the car, I had about 30 minutes of sunlight and then it was dark pretty much until the hour before we finished. So, you know, you get kind of tunnel vision, time warp. You hardly know what time it is or where you are. I mean, it can be really disorienting, especially after you've already been up for 24 or 30 hours, you know. So um, I, I have uh, Melissa. She posted uh, requirements are to not sleep, not die, be ready at all times and eat lots of tacos and drink Fanta. It's, it's <laughs> Pretty much Baja on a stick right there. <laughs> that that blows my mind that this vehicle, this stock Land Cruiser, can actually take this sort of punishment. And not only that, Ron, but like stock, uh, the, the engine's never been swapped out. It's got, we think that it's got about 23,000 race miles on it, which is just like insane. Uh, the same engine, same transmission that we've always had in that thing. And we've swapped everything else out numerous times, but... That's a, that's a testament to engineering right there. And, and, and ME would appreciate that. 
So oh, that I mean, it doesn't get much more much more brutal than that, and it is brutal, right? Like you are going up and down, and at what what speeds are you going? Uh, so the speeds vary a lot, but I would say like, I mean, our average speed, if you just did like a linear time average of our speed, you know, we would be between, you know, 28 and 32 miles an hour or something like that. But that means that we're going a hundred miles an hour in some spots and we're going five miles an hour in other spots. But, um, you know, a dirt road that you might be comfortable, you know, going, you know, five or 10 miles an hour on, we could easily do 55 or 60 on usually, you know, so. Um, so we can keep the speeds pretty high, but it's, it comes at a cost of the car and it comes at a cost to your bodies because you're just, it really does beat you up a lot. So, um, so we always say that we're driving for conservation. We're trying to turn over a running driving car to the next set of drivers. Um, and so, you know, we might only be driving at like a 10 if we were trying to close a 10 or 15 minute gap with the lead car and the last, you know, hundred miles of the race. Like other than that, you're, you're more like a, you know, 50 to 75%, 80% kind of neighborhood. Um, as far as like the abuse on the car and how hard you're really pushing it. What roles do you play on this team or what roles do you have on your Baja 1000 team? I guess officially I'm the crew chief. Um, it's a pretty egalitarian group. I mean, there's not a lot of like, you go do this, you go do that. But, um, we need some decision makers. So I'd say between me and my buddy, Dave Connors, um, we're sort of, I guess the, the leaders of the group in, in a lot of ways, all the, all the wrenching happens at my place. And so I've got a nice facility where we can do all the, all the working on the car and that kind of thing. And Dave's sort of the logistic, just logistics master. And then, you know, we've got, I mean, everybody chips in like, you know, one, you know, Darren orders all the parts. And I mean, you know, Kurt's just a Kurt's our other mechanical engineer, and uh, and he runs a, a Land Cruiser shop called Cruiser Outfitters, and he, you know, he's handy with parts, but he's also just a brilliant mind for wrenching on cars. I mean, it, the list just goes on and on. Like it's sort of a dream team in a lot of ways. But um, my official capacity is is sort of uh, crew chief and um, keeping everything moving forward. I guess. So, Hi. How many teams are competing at the Baja 1000? How many, how many trucks start the race? Uh, so trucks, so you've got the cars and trucks and you've got the bikes. Uh, the bikes are the motorcycles, the cars and trucks are everything else. And uh, I think that there are usually between three and 400 entries total in that. And, and it's probably, you know, half to two thirds of them are trucks, I would say. So you're probably, you're probably 150 to 200 trucks. Okay, so there's something very special happening here, and I'm wondering if you can translate it for me. Okay. In my notes, I have that you have finished seven of eight races. I'm assuming there's a ratio where trucks or cars don't even finish that start. Maybe Sorry. we'll start there. Yeah, so that's that's the attrition rate. And um, so when I, when I told you earlier that we'd finished seven out of eight, that's just in the Baja 1000, but we've got we've got more finishes and more races than that in the U S. So like we, I mean, so we've raced in the biggest Reno several times and finished that several times. And we, I mean, there's some smaller local races, but I think most people consider the Baja 1000 to be the, I mean, that's the top, that's the, that's the, that's the one you want to do. Um, so, but as far as the, the attrition rate, yeah, it can, it can vary anywhere between, you know, 45 and 55% of the field won't finish, uh, depending on the year and how hard the course is and that kind of thing. So, uh, so even crossing the finish line is sort of a big deal because, um, it's just, it's just a tough race. So, and I'm, I'm being, I understand there's, a, there's a lot of different races. Uh, the notes I've, I've gathered are, are specific to the Baja 1000 and you finished first in your class twice. And second in your class three times, which means out of your eight starts, you finished first or second five times out of a field of hundreds of other teams. Um, it's a little bit of an unfair. Uh, uh, the, the only thing is that like in, in our specific class, which is where our, where our first places are, uh, the field is usually much smaller than that. So like, I mean, we're not, we're not taking first overall. I mean, I would say we're still pretty dominant in our class, but we're not overalling the Baja 1000. I mean, that's like, that's a different class of guys that are doing that, but we're still, we're still, we're still 
pretty dang good, man. I mean, well, it, regardless, you're in a class. That's what the class you've chosen to compete in. This yeah. is a, a, a that is. Uh, by your choice, maybe, and your ability to invest time into the project or the hobby and or the ability to spend money. I mean, these things are this is an expensive hobby, I'm imagining. It's an expensive hobby. And we've got a we've got a great thing worked out as far as just like the way that all goes down. But I mean, we yeah, we've definitely learned like how to keep the car together. And what probably the biggest thing we learned is how to prep the car and keep the car like in top shape. So We've learned, you know, that going into a race like that, that you can't cheap out on any part of the of the of the race preparation, because anything that you think uh, it ought to be good for this race, like you just can't risk stuff like that, because that's when a two dollar part takes you out of the race. So, so, I'm from my vantage point, you're clearly practicing excellence in a way that is leading to continued and ongoing high levels of performance of your race team. I would agree with that statement. What to you stands out that maybe you guys are doing different or at a higher level than others that you're competing with? I would say back to the race prep. I think that that's a really big deal. We're really thorough on the race prep and knowing, knowing the limits of, of, of the things. And the other, probably one of the really big things is uh, just our, um, our race logistics. So like I said, my buddy, Dave Connors does our, our race logistics and getting people to the right place at the right time, but also the mentality of the drivers and just making sure that everybody's everybody knows what the commitment is. And the commitment isn't necessarily that they need to be the fastest driver. It's that they need to keep the car going. I mean, the longer the car stops for any reason, the less of a chance you've got to win a race. So, so keeping forward progress at all times is, is, is a really big deal. Maybe to inverse the question, what is something others might, maybe not pay attention to that sometimes leads to their early exit from these races well so uh there's a there's a famous baja 1000 documentary called dust to glory and i think you should watch it if you if you don't know about it dust to glory and um it's awesome and um it, it'll it'll answer a lot of questions for you but there's uh there's a there's a part uh, where one of the trophy truck drivers, the trophy trucks are the biggest, baddest trucks out there. These are these are five hundred thousand to a million dollar trucks. And these are, I mean, you know, seven, eight, nine hundred horsepower, 36 inches of suspension travel. The there. big jumps. I, I, I think I've seen some of that. They're, they're the big dogs. And 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 one of the drivers said any idiot can get in a, in a car and pin it. Um, and and that's true. Anybody can get in the car and pin it and make it go fast for a certain amount of time, but it really takes a lot of self-control to be the one who's not pinning it all the time. But I've driven uh, that first section of the course, the first 150 miles of the course a few times now. And it's amazing to me how many cars are like rolled over in that section, how many cars have like blown engines and transmissions in that section. And it's, it, there really is a lot of adrenaline and a, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, need on a lot of people's or at least desire on their on their part to really like get after it and just drive super aggressively but um they destroy their cars very quickly i mean i think that there was a year that um that pastrana's group was that was driving a, a a trophy truck i think they only made it like seven miles before they blew the motor in that thing i mean it was like it was it was incredibly short and the other thing like about trophy trucks is They'll tell you it'll cost seventy or eighty thousand dollars just to roll those things off the off the truck. Like a race prep for those guys is seventy or eighty grand. <sighs> Holy so. cow, that that's amazing. What what have you learned from your years of racing? I mean, it sounds like your years of entrepreneurship and your years of racing. I mean, they, they've they've been in parallel. You started your business in 02. When did you start racing? Uh, we did our first. Baja went, so we started racing in 2011. <clears throat> okay. What, what lessons from racing have carried over to business? Well, I think that that forward, that forward progress thing has a lot of merit, you know, I mean, even if the progress seems slow in business, like as long as we're trying to do better all the time and try to, you know, improve a little bit, but you know, all the time, I think if we're conscious of those things, that's, that's a pretty big deal. I think there's a lot of people who kind of do some cool projects and let rest on their laurels and are not trying to get better. But um, I know I haven't found the end of the road as far as being better. I mean, I just think, you know, you can constantly be improving and constantly making things better. So 
Yeah, no, that that makes sense. What what is your well? Actually, I have another picture. I'm going to swap the picture up, but I want you to explain this one to me. What are we looking at here? All right, what is this? This looks like a truck, but it looks like a tank. So yeah. I just know that I want one. <laughs> so what what is this? That is actually the race car. Um, but so I've I I wish I had a picture that I'd sent you of. I built this Toyota Sequoia that's on those tracks and it's got these cool Star Wars graphics. Man, I'm into some weird stuff, Ron. And so like one of my favorite things is like snow going vehicles. So so this is meant for snow, but I also have I have two piston bully snow cats, which are like the big resort level like grooming snow cat machines. Um, and I've got a little light track 700 that's like on snowmobile tracks and I've got this Sequoia that's on tracks. So this is this is when I first got these uh, this track conversion for the Sequoia, and just as a goof, I pulled the race car out of the out of the shop and threw the threw the tracks uh, in front of the wheels just to just to say, hey, maybe we should convert the race car to tracks. But it was just it was just okay. So that's actually fun. not attached. This is an optical illusion of seeing the race tracks in the foreground and the the, the race truck behind it. It is, it is, but okay. I mean, it, but I, but I could send you some pictures of the of the sequoia, which you'd probably you'd probably dig. So I, I would totally. All right, and Ted just posted. He says snow cats. That snow cat is is the thing that you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I, I I love snow cats, man. I think they're the coolest machines. So. Well, I don't even know what a snow cat is, so now I'm gonna have to go. Everyone listening is like, all right, they're if they don't live somewhere where there's snow, they're googling snow cats. Do you want me to email you a picture of my snowcat? I, I totally want you to email me a picture of a snowcat. I want to know what what that thing is. Okay, um, send it to you. Awesome. Uh, I have a actually we have a message here from Keith. So let's give Keith the shout out. Keith uh, from uh, HTSA it says Ron, another good podcast. Ron just wanted to tell Ryan, welcome to HTSA. I do not think I knew that happened, Ryan. So congratulations. Hope to meet you at the virtual conference. He will meet me at the virtual conference, and uh, and thanks to both of you, I guess I owe both of you a thank you. So, oh no, I mean, so tell us why you've joined HTSA. Um, in your words, from your vantage point, what is HTSA, and why did you decide that it was uh, a, a good idea for you to join? Well, uh, HTSA is a buying group, and as probably people know, there's there's only a handful of buying groups in our industry, but. Um, the more I learned about buying groups, the more interested I was in joining one, but, um, it's sort of like finding the right fit for you too. You know, they all have a little bit different philosophy and they all have a little bit different, uh, lines that they support and, um, the benefits are all a little bit different, but it's not really just about, you know, getting discounts on products or anything like that. Like, I think, I think probably the biggest reward is the, uh, is the interaction with the other members and the learning resources and kind of like all banding together to make sure that we're doing it the best way that we can. But, uh, um, HTSA, um, I, I did some digging around and it just seemed like HTSA was the top dog and, um, it's, I don't know, it's, it's pretty awesome, man. And when I, uh, when I joined up, I actually got, you would have thought that I won the lottery or something. I got a lot of emails from my from my sales reps. Um, so really? No, yeah. it's a big deal. That's not to be it taken is, lightly. That number one, is, everyone that wants it doesn't get in. Well, yeah, that's and that's the truth because I had, I had looked at others and was swiftly declined from those groups, and um, it, it, that only happened with one other group. But um, but needless to say, I'm happy I landed at HTSA. But you know, when they, when they alert all of the, uh, account managers and the, uh, the account reps, uh, that you're an HTSA guy now, I mean, everybody reached out. It was pretty impressive. I they were like, wow, you, you made it HTSA. And I'm like, yeah, like you're, <laughs> like, you're in the fraternity now. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Like, I mean, one of my reps said, that's Mount Everest, buddy. Anyway, yeah, was, that's, I, I'm really happy to be a part of it. So that is cool. I, I want to uh, ask you about uh, kind of a, a topic that I think is close to many people's hearts and minds here over the last year relating to COVID. And I guess I'll talk a little bit COVID. Every, I guess my audience generally appreciates to understand how people are you know, dealing with it. Um, but there's a, a concept around balancing work life and, you know, home life and, you know, family and friends. And in your case, you, you clearly have a fun hobby. 
How do you think about that? And how do you design your lifestyle to try to make sure that you're, you're putting those all in the right perspective? Well, there's no shortage of hobbies in my life. Um, I'm a guy who's interested in a lot of things and those things kind of become my hobbies and my wife would agree with that. I'm sure, uh, there's no, no shortage of stuff going on in my life. Um, I don't know. I think probably from the outside, it would look like I've got way too much going on all the time, but I try not to focus on, on any one thing for, I mean, I've been focused on desert racing for 10 years, you know, I'm, and I'm not saying that I'm taking any way, anything away from that, but I, I like to be focused on a project and a bigger goal. And then I like to, you know, focus on some other things for a while too. So, I mean, I play music with friends of mine. I, I, I go and do sound for concerts. I uh, do the Baja racing. I um, do, you know, random home improvement uh, uh, projects. I'm, I'm very active in my church and I go and do stuff, you know, teach Sunday school and that kind of stuff. And I just think that, I think that having your foot in a lot of different arenas is a good thing for people. I think focusing on any one thing for, for too much of the time is, is tough for people. And I think that, um, I think we get a lot of inspiration in other parts of our lives also. So, um, I read a book, uh, recently called range, um, and um, I don't know if you've read that book. No, I haven't. Um, Epstein was the guy's last name, um, but it um, it talked about how how generalists thrive in a specialized world. Uh, about how people who can who can take things. Your last your last uh, uh, podcast uh, guest was going to be a veterinarian, right? That's and right. Yeah, Mark through a very strange uh, path ended up at IBM, and then ended up you know doing some other things, and ended up in in Consumer it, electronics, it, right? That's right. And so um, it talks a, a lot about that type of person, people who can't declare a major, people who go for five years down one path and then, you know, quickly turn to another. But it's usually the people who have broader experience and can take things from other realms that innovate in their fields um, and not the people who are, I've got a PhD in bending of a paperclip in this one specific method, you know? Um, it's, it's more like, well, oh, well, I learned some stuff in the AV business and I could maybe apply this to big blue, you know? So, um, so anyway, I, I just think that there's a lot of inspiration to be had in other, in other parts of, of, of my life. So I try to focus on them all. Well, I, I think that you're, uh, and I, there's some beautiful comments here in, uh, the chat. I'll even share Melissa says his heart is where he is family, friends, work, hobbies. He's easy to love. Uh, uh, there you go. Very number one fan. No, your number one fan, right there. Um, let's talk COVID. What what happened in 2020, and how's 2021 looking so far for you? Um, in 2020, we all, of course, uh, were pretty freaked out about what was going on. And uh, if there's ever a slow time in my year, it just seems like it's always like middle or early March. So it would like have been in that time anyway. Um, but you know, the crap hit the, hit the fan, so to speak. Right. And, um, we were still able to keep working just because of what we did. And, um, 2020 just, I mean, really, you know, this, but for our entire industry has been a big windfall for us. I mean, so many people working from home, so many people in their homes that, that want to not feel so isolated and need better Wi-Fi and need better, um, you know, zoom meetings and need to be able to release a little bit and have some better music in their house. Like, I mean, we were just as, I mean, 2020 was our best year yet and 2021 is looking great too. Um, and so really the pandemic was business wise. It was, it was just fine. It was not that big of a deal. It was, it was tougher at home with the kids at home and having, um, you know, homeschooling, which my, my sweet wife took the lion's share of the, of the heat on that one. But, you know, our kids went back to school in the fall and I know that's not the same for everybody, but, um, our kids went back to school in the fall and that's been incredible for them. And honestly, like the, the, the COVID thing at the, at the public schools for the kids that are in elementary school, all of my kids are in elementary school. Um, the cases have been very, 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 very few. And, They've only uh, they've only missed maybe a couple of days of school out of out of the entire year due to to coronavirus. So 
Um, we've been very fortunate in that regard. And again, I am sensitive to the people who aren't so fortunate in that regard. Like I know there's a lot of people who are still still fighting that fight. A lot, lot of industries that didn't get so lucky to be in a, a space that, you know, would boom during a pandemic. Yeah, and it's it's hard to have that conversation or you don't really want to tell people that, you know, 2020 was your best year when somebody's closing their restaurant or whatever the case might be. I mean, I think that I think that there have been, you know, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of restaurants in Utah that have just closed, you know, uh, just because they just can't do it, you know, so um, not enough takeout for everybody. So, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. What technologies out there, you know, we, we play with automation and audio video and all sorts of neat stuff. What, what stuff has you super interested? It could be old stuff, could be new stuff. Anything that has you particularly jazzed right now? Well, I mean, I love speakers and just like straight up, you know, two channel stuff, but I also love, I, I don't know, man, it's, it's back to like my whole life, you know, with not being able to focus on one thing. Like there's not one thing about what we do that is so intriguing to me. I really love doing all of it. Like I love going in and hearing a, a really sweet, just single pair of speakers with a subwoofer or something like that, or like these intense movie theater rooms where you've got acoustic treatments all over on the walls and like cool lighting projects. I love them all. I, I don't know. I think that lighting and shading projects are, are very intriguing to me, but also like mechanical automation projects are neat too, where TVs come out of places where they're not. Do you do much of that? Do you do much of the, like the hidden technology, the, the motorized TV lifts or art lifts or stuff like that? Yeah. 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 We did. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll shoot you a, a video of one that we did recently where we motorized a piece of art and you can't ever see the lifting mechanism for the piece of art and it fully covers the TV. And so the, the art just floats, it just floats in front of the TV and uh, and it just and it just hovers right over it. And then the TV appears and it's like, holy crap, that's awesome because it's right over the fireplace and it's like perfect viewing height. And it's really what, great. What gear did you use to do that? Do you mind uh, sharing? We, yeah, Future Automation. And uh, and that was, yeah, that was the pick H, I believe is what we used. And it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty clever little mechanism that they've got and it worked really well and um, you know, so we've done that. We we love future automation. They build really great mechanisms. They're super quiet. Their TV lifts are fast and quiet. I mean, there's just there's just nothing else like them in my opinion. But the uh, there there are some other good products out there. But we've kind of hitched our cart to future automation as far as that kind of thing goes. Um, what about supply chain issues? What are you seeing right now? You know, it's March twenty fourth, twenty twenty one. What's your current state of affairs there in Utah? So our, our state of, of affairs, we've been able to kind of keep POs moving on a lot of the stuff that we use all the time. We're, we're a big Sonos house. We do a lot of Sonos equipment and, and they've been very, very, very difficult to get just because they've got some supply, supply chain issues on their side. But we've been doing a good job just getting like regular POs turned in. So we've, we've had a steady flow of equipment coming from them and they've been good to us. Um, and then as far as the others go, a lot of the stuff is is still pretty readily available. We've done pretty well with most of it. Um, the big thing that most industry people right now will 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 attest to is that AV receivers are very difficult. Hmm. Um, the uh, the the company that makes the DSP chip for I think all of the big manufacturers for Sony, for Onkyo Integra, for um, for Denon, Marantz, uh, Yamaha. I believe that the company that makes that DSP chip they they had a fire. And they're operating at like 10% capacity or something like that. So, um, so receivers have been kind of slowly coming in, but there, it's not like it was a year ago when you could just be like, Oh, Hey, I just need a receiver. I'll just go grab one down at the, down at the local distributor or anything like that. Like it's, you've got to, you've got to make some deals with the devil to get a receiver. Right now. <laughs> what, what about the world of uh, tunable lighting, tunable white, you know, circadian rhythm lighting, um, that is, is a, a, a good number of manufacturers in our space promoting that concept. Are, are you bought in on that? Or are your, is your marketplace demanding that or wanting that? We, we have not gotten into that. Like I'm, I'm into it. I like the idea of it, but it's a, it's a hard sell for somebody who, who was going to spend $60 on a light fixture and now is going to spend eight or $900 on a light fixture. Um, there are obviously more economical ways to do that, but um, 
that's that's an, that's a new hurdle I think that we've got to overcome. Like we've got to educate builders a little bit better on 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 why those things are important. But then it also it also kind of comes down to the budget too. If they don't have something, you know, if they don't have high end lighting in the budget already, then it's going to be tough to sell them a hundred thousand dollar you know light fixture package just because they might feel better. I mean, some of the ultra wealthy can do that kind of thing, but um, but but some. You're not seeing the demand for that yet, and you your company is not yet proactively promoting that science. Correct. Yep. It's still we're still kind of uh, infants when it comes to that. That's for sure. So. Kind of along the same theme, uh, the the concept of wellness, you know, technology. So I'll say air purification, water purification, tunable lighting fits into this category, and even wellness spaces. You know, th this is a theme. CE Pro has been writing about for you know, probably two, three years now. And there's, you know, a few new players, uh, what Delos and uh, Healthways, their pure products are, are now in our space. Is that in your ecosystem yet? Are you talking about those things or seeing no, demand? We haven't, but uh, probably it would just take a little education on some of those things. I honestly wasn't, wasn't aware that there were some products that were kind of geared toward our space that, that were doing that. I mean, I knew about obviously about uh, the circadian uh, rhythm and all all the lighting products i've um i've i've had my eye on that for a few years now but um but not not the other environmental stuff got it and then one other i'm just uh, you know i'm always seeing kind of new technologies that are bubbling up and i'm i'm always curious and i know my listeners are curious who else is doing it or you know who's doing what um, the world of, of solar, like tying into energy storage, into batteries in the home, which leads to a whole different genre called, you know, I'll term energy automation. Is that in your ecosystem yet? Or is that kind of like something that you're thinking about or talking about yet? No, I mean, we can we can tie some of that stuff in, like as far as, um, you know, integrating like the the in-phase energy uh, monitors, we can tie that into some of our automation systems and that kind of thing. But I would say as far as selling it and providing it, it's not really a, it's not really a thing for us. I mean, we've, we've looked down that road, but I kind of feel like there's sometimes there's so much, so much coming at us that we've got to focus on doing the things that we know well, and then start bringing some of the other stuff into there. And like, I just like don't have the bandwidth for some of that stuff right now. And I, I would love to, I would love to have the bandwidth for more of that, but I, maybe just because I'm so curious about everything, but, um, but. Yeah, I was saying, it seems like your curiosity, these would be some perfect subjects for you to, to oh, dig I, into. I know quite a bit about them. It's just, it's just more of a fact of like selling them because, you know, I mean, ask me about how to, you know, install a TV or what you do for sound in a certain area. And I could talk to you for a long time about it, but. I, you know, I would like to have a little bit broader knowledge probably before we really start getting into stuff, something like that. Then also there's only so much the techs can do in a day. <laughs> well, so that, that raises a question like knowledge and exposure to new ideas um, and or just training and upkeep on current product uh, and best practices with those products. Is that that's all still happening virtually? is are you seeing some of that go back to face to face or do you see that happening this year? Like do you see yourself inviting reps in to your office this year, 2021? Do you see yourself attending live shows where maybe you actually get to meet the engineers and meet you know, all the people behind the scenes at your, your partner vendors? Do you see that happening this year or is that a 2022 thing? I think we're going to see some of it reemerge this year. Um, you know, they moved Infocom to August, I believe. And I think that Infocom is actually happening. Um, and so honestly, like I would have no, no reservations with a rep or going to a show or whatever. Like, I feel like, I mean, especially as vaccinations improve and all that, but it, like, I pay a lot of attention to the music world too. And it seems like there's like, it seems to be September 1st is the big cutoff. Like, like a lot of stuff's ramping up after that. And there's a lot of people kept kicking off like pretty decent sized tours at that point, maybe not full. Like music tours? Music tours, yeah. Uh, maybe not full capacity, but like even up to 80, 90% in some of these scenarios. And then, wow. um, you know, I know that there's been no limitations from people I know who are like season ticket holders for NFL and that kind of thing that um, they, they're not saying anything about this is going to be a reduced capacity or anything like that. Like it's, it's sounding like things are moving forward, you know. I mean, I mean, 
hopefully, hopefully that's the case. I mean, we would all hate to be in this mess for, you know, any longer than we have to be, but I mean, Amen. The, 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 the vaccine, the vaccinations are happening pretty quickly here in Utah and they're doing a, a, a good job getting those out. I mean, my wife was able to, to, to make an appointment last night to, to, to get vaccinated. So, I mean, I think that things are moving along. My, my wife has been getting up. Uh, there's the local Publix, which is the grocery store chain here in Florida. Uh, you, there's two days a week that you can log in. And it, you know if you're over 18 and it's open to the public, you can register to get a, a ticket. My wife's been getting out of bed at 6 a.m. to try to be first in line on multiple computers. And so far, two weeks in, we're, we've been unsuccessful. But we're trying. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So they just opened, they just opened, uh, Utah to sort of the general, like 18 and up crowd just last night at midnight. And, okay. and, you know, uh, my wife was able to get her appointment for like April 5th or 6th or something like that. So, uh, well, that's good to hear. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, that might've had something to do with her staying up and, and getting on right, right when it opened. But at the same time, like I think things, good things are happening. So. Yeah. I mean, we're all trending in the right direction. Um, what, one more attempt at asking you to read your magic eight ball or your, your fortune telling, you know, whatever crystal ball, you know, there's a theory. I, I don't know uh, if it's only in my head or if it's held by you or others, but a theory that as the consumer, your customer uh, is, perhaps not locked down in the same way they're currently locked down uh, and they're vaccinated that they, they're going to start potentially going out of the house, going on vacations, you know, traveling, going kind of, you know, hopefully back to some version of a, a, a normal. Uh, do you think that that has an impact on our industry? I'll just say your, your lead flow, your project flow locally in your market or do you think that the the equation is too complex for that to singularly negatively affect you? I'm going to I'm going to look into my into my magic Oh, into your magic Josh. Josh. And I'm going to see if <laughs> see if the micro will tell me. <laughs> no. Uh, so I think uh, I think in Utah and I don't know. I think it's going to be market dependent for sure, but I think in Utah we're going to be pretty safe because We've had a huge influx of people wanting to get out of the city and, uh, you know, move to mountain communities. I know that, you know, Vail and Aspen have seen the same thing. And I've got a buddy who's an integrator in Santa Barbara who does a great job out there. And even just an hour and a half out of L.A., they've got just a massive influx of people trying to buy houses there. And mm. he said, you know, he's he's booked deeper in 2021 than he's ever been booked in his entire existence. And he's been around for a long time. Wow. Um, so I think that it depends on the community. I think, um, you know, maybe if you're in the cities, if you're in Silicon Valley, if you're in L.A., if you're in New York City, maybe those things are going to be tougher. But I think that at least those of us who live in the mountains or, you know, on the in places that are less populated, that maybe that's going to it's going to be a, a, a bit of a windfall for us. So. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. I think there's a big there, there's a dramatic shift in where people are going to live. And I think people are forming new habits around, um, you know, perhaps working or operating virtually, which means they're not, as you said, not tied to that big city, that big city job. They could do the big city job, but from wherever they want to live, yep. which means, you know, the open country and mountains and blue sky are certainly far more attractive. I've got a client, uh, some really great clients out in Vernal, Utah, which is Eastern Utah, which is like oil country. You know, I mean, that's like the reason that Vernal exists is from the oil and gas business. And that's traditionally been all that it is, is oil and gas. It all revolves around that. And that ebbs and flows over the years, as you know. But, uh, but you know, they're getting even out of counters wanting just to move into, you know, to Vernal, Utah that are just corporate guys that just don't want to live in the cities. And I think it's I think it's cool. It's going to, it's going to do some cool things for the country as far as the way that the population is spread around and, and to improve some of these areas and um, create up. I think there's going to be lots of opportunity for guys like us for all that too. So. Yeah, I agree. Well, Ryan, uh, believe it or not, it is that time. So I'm going to ask you for, first of all, people that want to follow your racing career, how would they do that? Where could they follow you maybe on social media? Uh, and, and then I'm going to ask for you, you know, your, you personally and your business, what are all the ways people can reach you? 
So uh, the the racing our our team name is called Kangaroo Racing, and it's not it's like kangaroo, but it's like the Spanish spelling of can, kangaroo. So C A N G U R O Kangaroo, uh, C A N G U R O Kangaroo Racing. We're on Facebook. That's probably the place where we're most active. We do some updates once in a while on our website. Um, we sell our merch on our website. Um, but Facebook is probably the best place to, to get us and get any, any kind of updates. Um, as far as ratio goes, um, I, I believe we're just ratio audio video, audio ratio audio video on our, on our Facebook. Um, so you could go to facebook.com slash ratio audio video and get us there. And that's where we're, and that's where we're most active too. Of course, we've got updates on our website and we've got mailers that go out and that kind of thing. But, um, and and I got to shout out one firefly because you guys do such a great job with our marketing and also our, our Facebook posts and that kind of stuff. So um, any of you industry guys who are considering uh, having somebody handle your marketing, Ron and his team have been nothing short of profesh. They've been awesome. So, well, uh, I will have your your twenty dollar bill in the mail. I appreciate that shout out. Uh, not necessary, but much appreciated. Ryan, it was a, a pleasure to have you on the show, sir. And uh, we'll definitely have to have you back and uh, and dig deeper into these topics. But uh, it, it was fun having you here. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Ron. I sure appreciate it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Uh, the one and only uh, Ryan Davis, a fellow ME. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of too many fellow Emmys, Emmys, uh, you know, mechanical engineering degree is what I studied in school clearly has so much to do with running a marketing agency and for Ryan running an audio video and integration business. Um, but, uh, that, that was a lot of fun. And so as always, I'm going to ask you if you have not already to, to subscribe to the podcast, go to your favorite, uh, app. Uh, I listen to my podcasts uh, on my Apple phone, and there's an Apple podcast app. Uh, but go to whatever your app is and uh, subscribe. That way you can – this uh, this is a live video interview, right? But the audio podcast version of this drops uh, – usually drops about a, one week later. So you'll see this drop in the audio podcast uh, one day next week, our uh, – our audio engineer, Carlos, will get all the post-production done and, and get that packaged up. And Stephanie and Allison and Carly and all the people at One Firefly that are involved with the show. That's a special shout out to them. Thanks for all your hard work and uh, getting all of the effort invested that it takes to actually do this live show and uh, as well as all the post-production for our website and our audio podcast. And uh, as always, uh, if you want to learn more about One Firefly, go to our website, give us a call. We'd love to hear from you. And I will see you all next week. Thank you, everyone.